subcommittee to order. A great deal has changed since our last hearing. The VA is finally acknowledging Oracle Cerner Electronic Health Record System is not fully functional and is not suitable to any other facility. After nearly three years of pressing forward, despite the mounting consequences to veteran safety, staff burnout, and billions of dollars wasted, Secretary McDonough and Dr. Evans have become realistic about the future of this ill-conceived project. That's encouraging. But it has been painful and very expensive to watch this disaster unfold. It's been frustrating to argue and plead with the VA not to march off a cliff only to be ignored or stonewalled. Thankfully, the department is now listening to what veterans, its own employees, and this committee have been saying for so long. It is far past time to look under the hood of the EHR and see if it can be fixed and whether progress is even being made. But be assured, that's exactly what we were about to do. We are here today to take an in-depth look at one particularly dysfunctional aspect of the EHR, and that's the pharmacy. Pharmacy is crucial to veterans' health and well-being, and unfortunately, it's one of the most error-ridden and dangerous parts of the system. First and foremost, we need to listen to the VA pharmacists who use it every day. To that end, the subcommittee sent questionnaires to each of the five medical centers using Oracle Cerner. We received responses from Spokane, Walla Walla, Columbus, and Roseburg. The situation they describe is outrageous and dangerous. The pharmacists cannot trust the system, so they have to work in a constant state of hypervigilance. The Spokane Medical Center has been live on Oracle Cerner EHR for two and a half years, and yet they continue to discover new problems every week. Across these sites, patient safety reports are up over 300% since the EHR went live, and about a quarter of these incidents are directly related to pharmacy. The medical centers have added on an average of 20% more pharmacy employees to perform the same workload on top of relying on support from remote pharmacists. Columbus even had to dedicate a pharmacist to manage the Cerner help desk tickets full time. And they created a management position in the pharmacy just to deal with the EHR. Altogether, the pharmacy operations at Spokane, Walla Walla, and Columbus have seen a more than $9 million deficit from increased staffing costs and lost co-pays and collections. On average, the staff struggles with the EHR have shaved about 22 points off of these medical center scores in the best places to work survey. The pharmacists are in distress, and they do not feel their concerns are being taken seriously. That is deeply unfortunate because they, not the VA central office, not Cerner, have been doing the crucial work to document the system's flaws since the very beginning. It was the Spokane pharmacist who wrote the initial 57-page patient safety domain report in August of 2021. It was the pharmacists at these medical centers who identified the 79 business requirement change requests and continue to track them. Some of their findings went into the improvement sprint report that Dr. Evans' office released in March, but appears that much more was excluded. Oracle Cerner released pharmacy updates in February and late April, and another one is slated for August. The pharmacists believe some of these updates have been successful and produced incremental improvements. As for the more significant updates, they seem to have created as many new complications as they even resolved. And VA and Oracle Cerner are barely scratching the surface, tackling only a handful of the high priority issues from a list that is approaching 100. I appreciate all of our witnesses joining us today so we can dig into these pharmacy updates and their trajectory for improvement. We expect the VA pharmacists to give our veterans world-class service, and we owe them fully functional technology to do that. With that, I would yield five minutes to Ranking Member Sherfless McCormick for her opening statement. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. 
to discuss the critical project at the Department of Vet Veteran Affairs. I want to start off by saying that I wholeheartedly support the VA's decision to delay any further go lives while they fix the issue at five sites currently live on the CERNA system. I'm a co-sponsor along with Chairman Bost and Ranking Member Takano on the EHR Reset Act, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to ensure that we don't go live at any future sites until we fix the issue in the system. These sites have borne the brunt of VA's struggle to properly manage this project from the very beginning, and we owe them our focus. That being said, I have a number of concerns with the delay. VA has not provided the committee a timeline for when they expect the work to be completed at the live sites. I'm also very concerned that the VA has still not established a baseline EHR. Without a baseline, every future go live will bring more changes to the system. Constant change requests have and will continue to have major impact on the cost and timeline of the project and will force staff at the active sites to continually adjust their workflows. I have already heard from the staff that they feel like they are being repeatedly bashed into rocks by the waves of change. The change fatigue associated with constant adjustment is detrimental to staff morale and will have lasting effect on the VA's ability to recruit, re recruit and retain high quality staff and by extension on the veteran's access to healthcare. VA must shore up its governance process to ensure that any changes to the system are both necessary and the best interest of our veterans and VA providers EHRM cannot be allowed to go the way of VISTA, where every faculty is operating a different system. We hear frequently from the VA employees, and they continue to feel like their concerns are not being addressed and are bothered by the lack of information on the path forward. Communication with frontline staff must improve in VA if VA expects them to adopt the change. Also, there must be more emphasis on empowering employees in the decision-making process and having their issues fixed faster. There is an entire workforce of VA informatics who are being underutilized in this project that could be empowered to manage local configuration changes, which would drastically improve the timeline of these needs. I think this would also go a long way towards improving user satisfaction. Finally, I wanna address recent reports of patient harm caused by the new EHR. I've spent much of my career in healthcare, and I understand that it's not as simple as saying Cerner hurts veterans. However, the fact is that the EHR did play at least some role in these tragic incidences. I hope, both, I hope that both the VA and Oracle Cerner are looking at the system and the workflows and the policy of proactively identifying areas where there is potential for pa patient harm instead of reactively patching these places where harm has already occurred. On a more positive note, I'm cautiously optimistic that the new leadership team has made great progress in the short time that they have been in place. The attitude and experience of Dr. Evans has brought to his role is refreshing. And I am encouraged that the VA has chosen a practicing physician from its system to help turn the system around. Dr. Evans, your work, Dr. Evans, you and your work are cut out for you. And I look forward today to our conversations, and I'm encouraged to hear from everybody on how we can help make this EHR a reality for all of our VAs. Thank you so much. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Ranking Member Sherfless McCormick. I will now introduce the witnesses on our first and only panel today. First, from the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have Dr. Neil Evans, Acting Executive Director of the Electronic Health Record Modernization Integration Office. We also have Dr. Thomas Emmendorfer, the Executive Director of the Pharmacy Benefits Management Services, and Dr. Robert Silverman, the Chairman of the EHRM Pharmacy Council. Next, we have from Oracle, Mr. Celia, Executive Vice President for Global Industries, and Dr. James Elsey, Vice President for Federal Health. Finally, we have Ms. Carol Harris, the Director of Information Technology and Cybersecurity at the Government Accountability Office. I ask the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that this testimony you are about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the proof. Thank you, and let the record reflect that all the witnesses have answered in the affirmative.
Dr. Evans, you are now recognized for five minutes to deliver your opening statement. Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Churfilis McCormick, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of VA's initiative to modernize its electronic health record system. Today, as mentioned, I'm accompanied by my VA colleagues, Dr. Thomas Emmendorfer, Executive Director of Pharmacy Benefits Management, and Dr. Robert Silverman, the Pharmacy Co-Chair of the Council, um, the Pharmacy Council for Electronic Health Record Modernization. Before I speak about the impact of our electronic health record modernization efforts and the intersection with VA's pharmacy services, I'd like to first spend a few moments discussing our recent decision to halt deployment activities of the Federal Electronic Health Record in VA as part of a larger program reset. We've been listening to veterans and the VA staff who are using the new electronic health record at the medical centers, VA clinics, and remote supporting locations associated with our health systems in Spokane and Walla Walla, Washington, Roseburg and White City, Oregon, and Columbus, Ohio. We've also been listening to Congress, including this subcommittee. The new electronic health record is not meeting our expectations. And VA is electing the time to take the time to get things right. The program reset follows an extended pause in deployments that began in July of 2022, culminating in an effort to assess and address a more narrow set of issues deemed to be the most impactful, selected through the lens of patient safety. VA is already working with Oracle to ad address the issues identified, and together with Oracle during this reset, we will be able to more comprehensively address both these issues and a broader set of changes necessary for program success. Additional deployments will not be scheduled until VA is confident the new EHR is highly functioning at current sites and is ready to deliver for veterans and VA clinicians at future sites. This readiness will be demonstrated by clear improvements in the clinician and veteran experience, sustained, and high, performance, sustained high performance and high reliability of the system itself, improved levels of productivity at sites where the EHR is in use and more. When the reset period concludes, VA plans to release a new deployment schedule. The only exception to the full stop deployment activities is at the Captain James A. Level Federal Healthcare Center in North Chicago, a fully integrated VA and Department of Defense facility. To ensure that all veterans and service members who are cared for at this facility are covered by one EHR system, deployment activities there will continue with a planned deployment in 2024. And that deployment will, of course, also leverage the improvements made during the concurrent program reset. I'd like to now turn the, to the focus area of this hearing, a deep dive into pharmacy and the new electronic health record. The top priority of our pharmacy program in VA is to serve and honor the men and women who are America's veterans by delivering pharmacy programs founded on pillars of safety, quality, and value. In addition, customer service is a hallmark of VA pharmacy services. One example is the consolidated male outpatient pharmacy program that VA runs that provides prescription fulfillment to over 350,000 veterans every day. VA leads the mail order pharmacy business as validated externally by the annual J.D. Power and Associates National Pharmacy Study and has achieved the highest customer satisfaction score in 10 of the last 14 years. Managing over 146 million total prescriptions a year at VA, pharmacists and pharmacy staff are fully integrated into our care teams as first-class members of the team. The division that exists between the health system and retail pharmacies in the private sector does not exist in VA. Our pharmacy programs have achieved success by cultivating a culture of continuous improvement, and I want to acknowledge and thank our pharmacy community for using the same approach to identify the improvements that are needed in the Oracle Cerner pharmacy system and the electronic health record. The main concerns identified by our pharmacy community have been related to select aspects of an Oracle Cerner pharmacy application called Med Manager Retail, as well as its interaction with the core Cerner electronic health record, Cerner Millennium, and specifically Power Chart. A series of development efforts are underway by Oracle to improve the visualization of medications for both pharmacy, pharmacist and ordering provider, to improve synchronization between Med Manager Retail and Power Chart, and to improve the efficiency of the workflow for pharmacy staff as they process prescriptions and refills. Some improvements were recently delivered in a series of software updates over the past few months, and the remainder are planned for delivery between now and February 2024. 
The feedback from our pharmacy community on the recently deployed enhancements is that the improvements have been small and incremental. Although these improvements are appreciated, VA pharmacy staff and providers need an accelerated delivery of upgrades to, do, to eliminate the burden of the more labor-intensive human mitigation strategies that are currently in place. Furthermore, the current pace of new requests for upgrades and enhancements exceeds the delivery schedule of changes to address those requests. This will be one of our focus areas during the months to come as we work with Oracle Cerner to optimize and accelerate efforts where possible. Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Sheriffless McCormick, and members of the committee, thank you again for this opportunity to testify today and for all your continued support of our nation's veterans and their caregivers. Thank you, Dr. Evans. The written statement of Dr. Evans will be entered into the hearing record. Mr. Cecilia, you're now recognized for five minutes to deliver your opening statement. Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Sheriffless McCormick, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting us here today. I am joined by Dr. James Elzey from our federal EHR M team, and we look forward to this discussion about pharmacy capabilities for the new VA EHR. But first, with VA's announcement on April 21st of a reset for the EHRM program, I want to state again that Oracle is proud to continue to work together with VA to modernize its EHR system. We support VA's plan to improve the operation of the EHR at the current sites and take the necessary time to institute governance, change management, and standardization changes to ensure the success of future VA deployments, similar to what DOD did a few years ago. DOD's modernization is now nearly complete on time and on budget. We will continue to closely coordinate with VA to provide enhancements and updates to the EHR as we have since we closed our acquisition of Cerner last June. Since then, we have made significant progress on many critical issues that were impacting the EHR system, including its pharmacy capabilities. Overall, the system performance is significantly improved from where it was last summer. At the five currently live sites, on average, more than 200,000 prescriptions are being filled each month, and to date, 2.8 million prescriptions have been filled through the mail system CMOP. When a veteran comes in to get a prescription, the average window turnaround time across the currently live sites is 25 minutes, which is below the 30-minute key performance metric set by the VA. VA's pharmacy system does not operate the same as commercial healthcare systems, as Dr. Evans noted, where the EHR enables a provider to order a prescription, but the receiving pharmacy then utilizes its own software for the dispensing of the medication. In the VA healthcare system, VA is both the ordering party and the dispensing party through its own VA pharmacy, whether outpatient or by mail. Therefore, the EHR needs to support the supplying components to fill prescriptions. This fundamental difference is the reason that pharmacy enhancements were needed to tighten the integration between the outpatient pharmacy application and the provider ordering application. Shortly after the acquisition closed, I came to the Hill and met with many members who were interested in this program. In every single meeting, I heard about pharmacy and the need for these enhancements. Members were unhappy that Cerner had provided a timeline of up to three years to do the work once VA finally settled on its requirements. That was clearly unacceptable. So once the requirements for the enhancements were delivered to us in VA, by VA in August, we built and deployed the top three enhancements to VA in four months. There are seven total enhancements and their order was prioritized by VA. The remaining four enhancements will be delivered this year for deployment in 2023 and early 2024. That's a significantly faster overall time frame, timeline. We hope it shows you that the Oracle is a highly capable partner for VA and whether there's pharmacy enhancements or other fixes, we have put tremendous engineering rigor and resources into getting the work done well and quickly. We have also read the survey results around the recently delivered pharmacy enhancements. We're not completely surprised, given the first three enhancements delivered as prioritized by the VA, we're focused more on improving the ordering provider experience. The next set of enhancements are focused more on improving the pharmacist experience. And we believe that once delivered and implemented, then pharmacists will be in a position to provide very valuable feedback. One other point about the pharmacy system I would like to highlight is the new opioid advisor tool included with the EHR. This tool allows clinicians to simultaneously check data from 47 state prescription drug monitoring programs and Department of Defense facilities to prevent improper prescribing of controlled substances. The opioid advisor tool has automatically alerted providers to avoid prescribing opioids to high risk patients nearly 1800 times since November 2020. With the opioid advisor, the other modern features of the EHR and the enhancements completed and in process 
We believe that the pharmacy system will provide a high degree of safety for veterans as they receive their medications. However, we will continue to review it together with VA, especially given the reset period that we are now in. We will continue to work with VA to make sure that enhancements which are forthcoming are delivered on or ahead of schedule. And we continue to prioritize our work in pharmacy so that we are confident veterans will receive the medications they need when needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cecilia. The written statement of Mr. Cecilia will be entered into the hearing record. Ms. Harris, you are now recognized for five minutes to deliver your opening statement. Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Sherfulis McCormick, and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to participate in today's hearing on the pharmacy-related functions of VA's new EHR system. As requested, I'll briefly summarize the findings from our recently completed review of this mission-critical system. The results are applicable to the EHRM program as a whole, including to the pharmacy-related concerns discussed today. As you know, VA provides healthcare services to roughly 9 million veterans and their families, and relies on a legacy system called VISTA to do so. In June 2017, the department initiated the EHRM program to replace VISTA, and has obligated at least $9.4 billion on this program to date. This is also VA's fourth attempt at replacing the legacy system, and the implementation thus far has been just as challenging as the last three attempts, if not even more so. As such, we support VA's recent decision to pause future deployments in order to focus on making improvements at the five sites where the system is currently in use. In our most recent work, we detailed VA's gaps to effectively manage organizational change as well as the extreme dissatisfaction among users and system issues. This afternoon, I'll highlight three key points that VA should address during this reset period. The first is more needs to be done to adequately address VA's organizational change management challenges. Our recent review detailed eight leading practices for change management. VA had partially implemented seven and did not implement one, and these gaps occurred for a number of reasons but most notably, the department lacked a VA-driven strategy for how its efforts would supplement the contractor-led change management activities. As such, the activities focused on system deployment, not on user challenges with transitioning to new workflows. And the results of VA's own post-deployment questionnaires highlight the need for more attention to this area. On a scale of zero to 100, with 68 being average, Users rated their abilities to use the new EHR system somewhere between 23 and 32. We made seven recommendations to VA to address the gaps in their change management activities. Now to my second point. Users of the new EHR system are generally dissatisfied and this needs to be fully addressed before deployments resume. VA is well aware that its users are unhappy with the system. Their 2021 and 2022 user satisfaction survey showed this. For example, about 6% of users agreed that the system enabled quality care, and roughly 4% of users agreed that the system made them as efficient as possible. I've been auditing for over 20 years now across the federal government. These are the lowest scores that I have seen in government, hands down. With regard to the pharmacy module, users told us processing prescriptions took much longer in the new system leading to increased backlogs and decreased efficiency, which led to patient safety concerns because the pharmacy could not fill prescriptions in a timely fashion. The pharmacy department at one facility increased from 15 to 60 staff to manage increased workloads associated with the system. There were also multiple instances of double prescriptions and incorrect medication orders, and the list goes on. Furthermore, VA has not established goals to assess user satisfaction. Having such goals in place would provide the department with a basis for determining when satisfaction has improved and also help ensure that the system is not prematurely deployed to additional sites which could risk patient safety. Accordingly, we recommended that VA set these goals and also demonstrate improvement toward meeting them in prior to future system deployments. And now to my final point, VA did not adequately identify and address EHR system issues. VA has not conducted an independent operational assessment of the new system and as of January did not plan to do so. This critical evaluation performed by a third party would enable VA to systematically catalog, report on, and track resolution of assessment findings with greater rigor, transparency, and accountability. We recommended that VA make plans to have the independent assessment done. 
In summary, the successful implementation of the new system across the VA will require a level of program management, adaptability to change, and sustained system performance that the department and contractor have yet to demonstrate. The continuance of VHRM is not without risks, but with strong oversight from this committee, in addition to improved VA program management and contractor system performance, we can increase the odds for success. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Harris. The written statement of Ms. Harris will be entered into the hearing record. Before we proceed to questioning, I ask unanimous consent for Representative Mike Carey and Representative Troy Balderson to participate when they are able to get here. Hearing no objections, so ordered. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questioning. Dr. Evans, are you committed to making the Oracle Cerner Pharmacy software and the EHR as a whole fully functional before restarting any go lives? Yes. Um, I mean, that is the purpose of our program reset at the highest level is to have a single minded focus on the system improvements and frankly also the process improvements that are necessary for us to have the confidence that we can move forward with further deployments. And are you willing to rely upon the input from the directors of the facilities that the system is fully functional in order to account for that recognition? Yes, absolutely. I just was in Columbus last week meeting with the facility leadership in Columbus, and I look forward to meeting with the facility leadership of all the facilities that are currently using the EHR. Pharmacy is just one aspect of EHR's problems, but it's very important because it directly affects veterans. What is necessary to make the system fully functional? As was mentioned by Mr. Cecilia, when we talk about pharmacy, there are three main stakeholders. There's the ordering provider who's ordering the prescription. There's the pharmacist and pharmacy staff who need to process that prescription and interact with the ordering provider. And then of course there's the veteran who's receiving the prescription. When we talk about the health information technologies that support an effective pharmacy operation, we need to take into account all of those stakeholders. One of the areas that you heard discussion about in some of the opening remarks here um, was around supporting the efficiency of pharmacists themselves to be able to safely and effectively do their work, whether that be communicating with the ordering provider or processing prescriptions and refills. And at the, at the top level, it's that efficiency and quality of, of processing prescriptions and engaging with veterans that that we are measuring the success of, the, of this technology to meet our needs in, in VA. Thank you very much. Mr. Cecilia, you testified to the Veterans, uh, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee in March. Uh, quote, we believe from a performance and scalability standpoint, the system is ready for the resumption of deployments. End quote. Five weeks later, Secretary McDonough halted all future implementations. What's your definition of ready? I was referring to the technical readiness, the performance, scalability, uptime, the clinical decisions, of course, belong to the VA. So clearly you and Secretary McDonough have different definition of ready, could we say? I, I don't believe that the clinical, the clinical areas of the system are my uh, responsibility. I'm not a provider, I'm not a doctor, I don't make those decisions. I can Okay, work. so the VA has requested budgeted $1.8 billion for fiscal 24 based upon the old scheduled rollout, which included 10 facilities, 10 more facilities. That's been frozen and the original five are not fully functional under the terms of the agreement. I've heard a lot of pledges from Oracle over the last six, seven months about standing by their product and being this large institution that is prepared to take this on. The product has never performed as advertised and has caused so many problems, the secretary has delayed further implementation. You cannot blame that on staff. Do you think $1.8 billion for fiscal 24 is fair compensation to Oracle for an EHR system that's not fully functional in the five facilities that it's located in and an elimination of the 10 that were scrubbed? Well, the, 
the, the total amount of money contemplated includes lots of different things. Software plus go live services. Obviously, obviously if the system's not going live, we're not going to be compensated for, for those services. So but you would say that, that the $1.8 billion would be excessive for Oracle to receive for compensation in, in fiscal 24 based upon the 10, the 10 facilities that are not going to be well, brought on and, and the five that are not functioning now. If we're not going to resume go lives, then sure, that's, that's, not going to be, that's not going to be the number. Okay, do you think it's fair to enter into a new contract and hold taxpayers responsible for a failing system and sites that were never even added onto? I would say that if the system was core and fundamentally flawed, it, it would not be live at Walter Reed, Fort Belvoir, by the way, we went live at the same time, the same weekend, in parallel at those sites. The Department of Defense runs the same exact system. I We're do, not talking about not the Department of Defense. In case you didn't see the sign on the door, excuse me, Mr. Seale, this is the Veterans Administration. This is the House Veterans Affairs Committee. Do you think the taxpayers should pay $1.8 billion, which was scheduled for 24, for a bill for 10 facilities that are not even going to be utilized and for the five that aren't fully functional. No, I, I don't think they, they should because the systems are obviously okay, not going to go fine. live. Thank you. Uh, I will turn over uh, to Representative Sheriff Phyllis McCormick for five minutes question. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. My question is for Dr. Evans. Dr. Evans, how are pharmacy-related patient safety events reported and investigated at the sites using Oracle Cerner? Any patient safety related concern is reported in the same way, regardless of whether it's related to pharmacy or any other part of uh, care delivery. It's, these are reported um, by, uh, they can be reported when a user is calling in and reporting a ticket or entering a ticket, and they are entered into something called the Joint Patient Safety Reporting System. Um, our National Center for Patient Safety, as well as um, within VA, um, as well as patient safety experts within the Electronic Health Record Modernization Integration Office, as well as informatics patient safety experts within the Veterans Health Administration, take every one of those reports seriously, evaluate what has been reported, investigate the issue, and identify solutions to address any findings that are there. One of the things that's very important is we encourage our end users to report concerns. We would rather have an over-reporting of concerns so that we can evaluate the possibility and address items that, that do prove to have patient safety risk. The second thing I would say is, is that, um, and I think there was a mention of this in comments earlier, a prospective forward-leaning approach to patient safety is also an important part of this program. Um, that is that we are, as we are configuring the record and, and improving the record, that we are thinking about and evaluating where there might be risk to patient safety and making those decisions on the front end to mitigate or lessen the risk of challenges down the line. Specifically, how does the VA leadership receive the results of these investigations? Um, with regard to if, I mean, this is part of our routine um, management of the system. So with regard to, if we're, if we're talking about patient safety um, reports or patient safety concerns, right, there are the changes we need to make to the system. Um, but then there are also, if there is a concern that there might have been patient harm, our National patient Center for Patient Safety will do a root cause analysis. And um, we have very regular discussions and meetings with that group to identify what has been found so that we can take action to improve anything that's necessary within the record. And how many actual patient harm events have occurred at the Columbus, at the Columbus Center that you're aware of? I would have to take that for the record to give you an exact number. And do you know if any of them or how many, even if you break it down in ratios, were from pharmacy or medical related? You know, I think when we talk about patient harm, Patient harm, healthcare um, can be complicated. It's a complicated, we, we're orchestrating the delivery, a, a team of individuals taking care of the veteran, um, imaging studies, orders getting placed, 
medications. There's a lot that's happening in healthcare. And in general, when we look at patient harm, patient harm is almost never unif singly attributed to an electronic health record. An electronic health record can have a role in patient harm, but it's often one of many facets. And so when we think about um, patient harm, it's hard to say, to answer your question, to say how many, how many events of potential patient harm, that is near misses, or actual patient harms, can be directly and solely attributed to the electronic health record. I guess what I'm trying to get at is we're trying to identify, are we really getting the numbers of VA leadership of how many patients are harmed and how can we improve it? So that's the specificity that we're looking for. Do you feel like you're getting the real numbers? Yes. And have you put together a pathway for improvement? Yes, I mean, I'm seeing the real numbers on a weekly, if not daily basis. Um, I'm able to review the numbers that are, that are being evaluated and we have a process by which we take the findings of what we learn to make the changes in the system that are necessary to enhance safety. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Sherfless McCormick. I now uh, yield to Representative Self from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have brought up in hearings before with the VA that uh, currently, it's in my, not in my district, but it's certainly in my area, the Dallas Vision, uh, I think the second largest in the system. And even under the VISTA system, uh, I hear from veterans all the time that their uh, pharmacy prescriptions are, uh, don't arrive, they arrive infrequently, they, are, um, they have to request them again. So uh, very interesting to hear the GAO uh, uh, brief that this a human factor issue. Uh, so my question is, how does, and, and we'll get to VISTA in just a second, this may be for Dr. Elmendorfer, uh, how do prescriptions get filled differently under Oracle than they do, Cerner, than they do under VISTA? Because I assume that you're using the same pharmacy human factors. Thank you, Congressman Self. So Oracle Cerner, our five Cerner sites, the vast majority of the prescriptions are filled in the same pathway as our VA medical facilities. Across the nation, 84% of all of our prescriptions are, go through our mail order pharmacy system. So the difference with our Cerner sites is what you heard uh, from the different uh, folks at the panel today, is the increase in staffing for our Cerner sites. So for example, in a Cerner site from visiting with our staff, it takes approximately three times as long to process a prescription in Cerner, but it's our staff's dedication to the mission to care for our nation's veterans that still ensures we're delivering high quality uh, pharmacy services to our veterans. So to my knowledge, I do not believe that there's significant delays uh, coming from uh, prescription delivery services uh, from our CMOP from our mail order pharmacy, whether it's Cerner or from a Vista site. The big issue for our staff, our pharmacy staff, is the amount of time it takes to process a prescription uh, to get the medication to the veterans. So if there's no difference in method and you're, um, um, so what is the advantage, what is the value added from Cerner then? So the value added to Cerner is if you look globally at uh, our pharmacy system, we do have elements of our electronic health record system that do need to be modernized. So just to give one example is we do, we've had a requirement going back to the early 2000s where we do need a perpetual inventory system. So a perpetual inventory system would be highly advantageous to our enterprise because that would allow us the ability to have um, I could be sitting here in my office and be able to look at the inventory that's on hand across the enterprise. So uh, that would be one advantage, regardless of modernization of our electronic health record uh, and how that happens. That would be one advantage that we would see in pharmacy. Hmm. Um. 
Wow, your testimonies have taken me to a higher level than my questions, so I guess I want to drop down to um, one of my last questions. Is this, a, is this a matter of will to make this happen? Because, again, the human factors to me are fascinating. If, if Oracle says the, the, the system itself is ready to go and yet the human factors are not there, that's where we're failing. Is this a matter of the will? Because we've heard that it's incredibly more expensive to do this system, and yet the VA, if I heard uh, the uh, Oracle representative right, is where the human factors have not been taken into account. So is this feasible long-term? Does the VA want to do this? I think I can... Um help answer that. As Dr. Emendorfer was saying, there are capabilities in the Oracle set of capabilities that have been on our list of things we've needed to modernize for a long time. Perpetual inventory system, as an example. A graphical user interface, it's a modern graphical user interface for pharmacists to use. Right now, pharmacy prescriptions are still processed in what we call a roll and scroll user, uh, interface in Vista. One of the issues that you've heard laid out here is, is that processing those prescriptions right now um, is not as efficient for our pharmacy staff. In part because our, we are, we are, we, there are system improvements that you've heard mentioned that need to be put in place to, Im, to allow us to deliver that more efficient operation, right? So, for the pharmacists. Uh, so there, there is a human factor element, but there are, um, but I would say the majority of this is that we need to adapt the, far, the workflows, the how the system works for our frontline pharmacists in processing prescriptions to be more efficient, to allow the, the, them to return to the same level of workload that they were able to achieve in the VISTA system. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Self. Appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Harris, we heard some testimony about the, the problem is the cl uh, clinics, the clinician, and not the, the actual software itself. And, and what's going on is, is clinically related, if you will. And I, we need to look at that a little bit because we're coming up on the, the renewal period for this contract, and I've got major concerns about how that's going to be addressed. Um, if mechanically you have a system that is functioning, but the people that are supposed to implement it are not able to do so, and it requires additional staffing, it requires workarounds, it has decreased morale because of utilizing this new system uh, to deliver the exact same number of units. While it might be functioning, it, it clearly isn't the people who are delivering the, 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 the work, if you will, uh, it's their problem because of something new that has been addressed to them. How will we know if the EHR is fully functional and how are we going to know when it's ready, in your opinion? Please. What you just described is not a functioning system. Yes, technically, if the system were to work, if the users are extremely dissatisfied, which is what we're seeing now, the system is gonna fail because it's not sustainable to have workarounds um, and, and you know, ad hoc out processes outside of the system. It, it's just not a sustainable solution. There will be increased patient safety risks as a result. Um, what we have identified through our work is VA lacks set, um, set goals for what constitutes a user satisfaction, and that's what we need to see. We need to see um, very clear objective measures for what constitutes adequate user satisfaction, and we need to have that defined before, um, and, and VA needs to demonstrate progress against that before the reset period um, closes and before they move forward with any future deployments. That's a major issue. Change management is also another significant issue. VA lacks a VA-driven strategy for change management. So Oracle Cerner has been doing quite a bit of work on training users in the system itself, but users are not prepared to change their business workflows because they just haven't been adequately trained 
and that's a major issue. And so VA needs to take a leadership role in leading that change management effort so that users fully understand the expectations around what, how their business processes will change. And, and could I just, a real simple question, do you think that this uh, new EHR system that Oracle has rolled out offers either safety, quality, or value at this current time? No. Thank you very much. Dr. Evans, in order to ever have confidence in the Oracle Cerner EHR, we need to see that it's working well in Spokane, Walla Walla, Columbus, Roseburg, and White City. We're a long way from that today, but maybe, even more importantly, the system has to demonstrate some sort of value to justify the enormous expense. It's not enough to merely swap EHR systems. How are you reevaluating re your strategic goals, and how will this project ever demonstrate a value proposition? I wholeheartedly agree that simply changing from one electronic health record to another electronic health record is not a strategy for value realization. The electronic health record is a, an absolutely critical element of the functioning of the modern healthcare system. But it's how one uses the electronic health record, how one configures it, how one enhances its ability to meet your business goals and frankly your customer service goals that delivers the real value. And you know, an example of that is that we, uh, we operate as an enterprise healthcare system. And so, you know, there are elements of this transition that are actually, frankly, quite critical for us to meet our strategic goals. If they're functioning properly. That's correct. Okay. But if one of our strategic goals is for us to be able to deliver care across the enterprise. Right now, there are telecritical care physicians that are telecritical care hubs that are caring for physician, patients remotely at 20, 30 different VA medical centers. And using Vista, they have 20 to 30 instances of Vista open to do that. It would be great for them to have one instance of the electronic health record open to be able to deliver care. And so to your point, this is where we need to understand what we're trying to achieve strategically to make sure that our investment in the electronic health record is allowing us to achieve those aims. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans, Dr. Evans. Um, Representative Sherfless McCormick, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Mr. Cecilia. We understand that an issue has arisen with certain medication and allergy information from Oracle sites not transmitting correctly to Vista. VISTA providers are receiving a warning to check through the joint longitudinal view whether their patients has received a medication at an Oracle site. And if so, the provider must check for all allergies and drug interaction problems before prescribing any new medication. Are you aware of this issue? I am not personally aware of this issue, but I would ask Dr. Elzey, um, who's, who's a clinician, Dr. for comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am aware of this situation, and we've actually rectified it for anything going forward. We've come up with a remapping to make sure that what's going back to the VISTA sites is the correct. We are still working with the VA to do the retroactive work that needs to be done for things that were already transmitted. And when did you discover that, and what was the root cause? Ma'am, unfortunately, I'll have to take that for the record. Thank you. Thank you. So my next question then is going to be for Dr. Evans. Um, are you aware of this issue, or were you aware of this issue? I am aware of the issue. And what was the mitigation plans that you guys quickly went into before Cerner corrected their plan? <clears throat> this is an issue that has to do with, it, again, I actually would highlight this follows on um, with the theme from Chairman Rosendale. Um, it's important for VA that we operate as an enterprise healthcare system. It's our expectation that if an order is, if a medication is ordered at any site, that regardless of what site it's ordered at, that we are doing drug-drug interaction checks, checking for allergies, that we are doing the safe things for the prescription of that medication. And so with this issue, there was a, an interface built between the Oracle system and 
what we call our health data repository, which is where we keep track of prescriptions that have been written from across the enterprise. Um, when we realized there was um, an issue there, um, we again gave instructions to our end users at our Vista sites for how to find the information that they need. And we have been working very closely with Oracle to execute the technical fix, which has already been done, and now to fix the data that needs to be adjusted um, in follow-up to this event. So again, when we find an issue like this, the answer to your question is it's all hands on deck, okay. all hands on deck to fix it. Well, thank you. I wanted to ensure that we had that communication in the lag time, if we can actually make sure that there isn't a big lag time because medications with allergies and intermixing is a deadly combination, which I'm sure everyone here is aware of. Issues like these have been a concern in the past and of course are going to be a concern going forward for the committee. The EHR Reset Act would require VA to contract for independent verification and validate, validation of the EHR program. And I feel like this is a perfect example of why something like this is needed. My next question is for Dr. Evans. We understand that these continue to be a problem with veterans addressing, reverting to their address in DEERS. The question is, this issue with DEERS was identified shortly after the first go lives. Why does it continue to be an issue? As you're aware, the electronic health record is a federal electronic health record. Um, that is being used by both the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs, the United States Coast Guard, and soon uh, NOAA as well. Um, DEERS is the identity system used by the Department of Defense. And the system was architected with a dependency on DEERS um, before VA was even involved with this project. Um, this is an area where we are continuing to work closely with the Department of Defense. In fact, um, we have uh, meetings scheduled even in, within the next week and a half at a very senior level, um, addressing issues around some of these points of intersection to include DEERS um, and its dependency uh, on the system itself. And how has this affected the mailing of medication and are you aware of instances where the medication was delivered to the incorrect address? Um, I am not personally aware of that. Um, I will, and I don't know whether my pharmacy colleagues can speak to that. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, Ranking Member Chairfulis McCormick, I am aware of some of the incidents in which uh, medication was mailed to an incorrect address as a result of uh, Deer's information being overwritten. It is my understanding that with Block 8, uh, which was installed February of this year, uh, the ability for that to overwrite in any VA data has been addressed uh, such that if the employees working on the EHR are recognized by the system as VA, that it will no longer take DEERS information uh, to overwrite the VA information. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I yield back? Represent to self recognize you for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go to the drop in um, uh, average scores of best places to work. Uh, these are dramatic, as the GAO, GAO briefed. Uh, did you see similar drops in locations that were were, were Vista only? Or, and I'm trying to get at: Are there other factors, or is it? Can we point to Cerner? alone? Um, I've not done that analysis with the level of detail where I feel confident uh, that I could answer that question. However, um, I've read the reports from the pharmacy and those numbers um, with regard to what, what the pharmacists are reporting at these sites are compelling. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the next question is, once something gets ingrained in a psyche of your organization, it's going to be hard to overturn. Are you confident that you can overturn these numbers? Because uh, believe you me, across the VA system, people know these numbers as well as we do. 
uh, will you be able to recover regardless of how well you do in your human factor uh, advantages now that you're, going, that you're assuring us you're going to put into place? Can you recover because of the deep ingrained dissatisfaction in your five Cerner sites? As Ms. Harris testified, it's not without risk as we move forward, but I think so. Um, when we think why? why? Well, when we think about what motivates VA healthcare providers, I am one, I'm a primary care provider, what matters to me is not the EHR, but the, how the EHR lets me take care of my patients. What, what, what drives the heart and motivation of VA healthcare providers and pharmacists who are healthcare providers, but really all of those of us who come to work every day to take care of patients in, B, in VA, is taking care of the veteran. It is the delivery of healthcare. That's what we do. The EHR needs to enable that. And when, you know, I believe that if the EHR is performing technically at the level that it should, that is, it is consistently up, that the capabilities are working in the system, and that it is performing quickly from a reliability standpoint, that there's no hangs, crashes, lags. When users see changes in the system that start to increase their confidence that the system is going to be there, and frankly, it's going to get out of the way and let them take care of the veterans that they've come to work to take care of that day. And when they start to see improved efficiency in using that EHR to get back to talking to the veteran, they will, you know, that, that is what will drive change, right? That's what drives user confidence. Confidence in a tool occurs when that tool is something that is fit for purpose, when it does that, what I want it to do. That's great theory, doctor, but you now have ingrained a deep satisfaction, uh, uh, dissatisfaction with it. And I see my time is, is gonna close real fast here. So I will say you look for new systems, you look at cost, time to implement and productivity. I've not heard a single positive out of this system in the several briefings that I have been in. So I think you need to examine that real carefully. Can you recover? As simple as that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Self. I would yield five minutes to Representative Balderson for questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to ask a question today, and thank you all for being here. Um, my first question is, is for Dr. Evans, sir. Um, it has been abundantly clear for about a year that the EHR system is unsafe and it has under, undermined healthcare delivery, operations, and morale in Columbus. I heard this from employees and veterans at Chalmers P. Wiley Veterans Outpatient Clinic when I toured last fall. Unfortunately, it sounds like Washington and Oregon are experiencing the same issues. I understand you have been there and heard the same concerns I've heard. If your improvement efforts are successful, what should we expect to see at Chalmers and elsewhere? In fact, I was there just this past Tuesday. I'm incredibly grateful for the leadership and the frontline staff in Columbus. Um, they are leaning forward um, and have been doing what, you know, have been raising their hands and, and pointing out the issues that we need to fix. A major part of the program reset is listening to our end users and more rapidly addressing the issues. As I mentioned before, what is the path to improvement? System reliability, increased efficiency in using the system, a better configuration um, that will allow improve, improvements in the configuration, um, and you know, regular closed loop communications around improvements. Um, that's what we're committed to do with all of our sites as part of this reset. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the next couple of questions I have are for anybody, and if you want me to directly ask somebody, I can do that, but if anybody would like to speak up, it's for any witness here today. Um, we have heard from pharmacists in Columbus that there have been over 730 Cerner, Cerner help desk tickets logged, averaging over three tickets per day for each pharmacist. 
Just keeping track of the help desk tickets is literally someone's full-time job. How do you justify the sheer administrative burden that has been placed on the facility? Good afternoon, Congressman Balderson. Uh, so uh, as you heard, I'm co-chair for the Pharmacy Council. Um, my co-chair, Dr. Ledoux, and I uh, are aware of the volume of tickets. And in fact, it is part of our recommendation for there to be a staff member of the pharmacy who is focused on addressing those tickets and being able to centrally be aware of them. And part of that is how the interaction plays between the reporting staff at the pharmacy and the help desk staff by Oracle Cerner that receive those. Um, we actually find that it is advantageous to have one person or a manager of staff that are aware of those issues in order to avoid the undesirable impact of two people reporting a ticket of similar issue and then having two tickets being worked concurrently with potentially not even the same results on that. So we'd like to uh, give some uh, appreciation to the EHRMIO office uh, for the funds that will allow Dr. Emmendorfer and myself uh, to travel to Columbus tomorrow, in fact, uh, okay. for an ongoing discovery visit. Uh, the team is already uh, in place there this week uh, to learn and continue to address these issues. Um, there, I, I have no concern about if, if there need to be tickets reported. We want that. We want to be accessible. We want to be approachable about that. Uh, and then the tickets need to be addressed to resolution. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, my next question again is for anybody, and it's the pharmacy piece too, so maybe you just want to continue on, Dr. Sherman. Um, uh, they had to increase staffing by 20%. Um, I mean, this is pretty much what you just said, so I'm down to 40 seconds. So I appreciate you all being here, and then I thank you for answering the last question pretty thorough. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you very, thank you very much, Representative Balderson. Um, Dr. Evans, you, I believe, I really do believe that the um, physicians and the folks that are delivering the, the health care to the veterans really do have a mission, a goal, and, and a, a life's goal of uh, making sure they deliver top quality health care to our veterans. I really do believe that. But to use an analogy, if um, you're given new tools, somebody comes out and gives you a chainsaw. And you're, and you're a lumberjack, and he doesn't give you any gas, okay? You're better off using the handsaw that you used to have. You'll actually be able to cut more wood than to sit there and try and make that chain drag across the log, okay? This question is for, uh, we're gonna start with Dr. Silverman. I'm going to read you a, a quote from one of the questionnaires. The Man Grand Staff VA has been live on Cerner for two and a half years, yet we all continue to discover new problems weekly. The 79 change request referenced earlier was a starting point. However, it's critical to note that many more issues have been identified since that time, and a list of change requests continues to grow at a rate outpacing that of resolutions being implemented. End of the quote. How could there be this many problems in just one area of the EHR, and how could the software be this ill-suited for the pharmacist's needs? Thank you for that question, Chairman Rosendale. As you heard in the opening testimony, the pharmacy solution that is part of the Millennium software is Med Manager Retail. It is uh, designed for the uh, traditional workflow in which the prescriptions are sent to the pharmacy, they are processed by the pharmacy and dispensed to the patient. And because VA pharmacy operates on this very tight-knit, closed circuit operation of pharmacy interaction with the prescribers, it is important to us to have that synchronization between the systems so that the activities of the pharmacist are then reflected in power chart, the prescriber's application. And that is among those top priorities that you've heard referenced for what we're seeking to work with is the ability for our pharmacy dispensing activities to show up in the ordering
profile. If they're, if they're working that closely, which is out of the uh, ordinary from what you see in the, uh, a typical setting in the public sector, why wouldn't it be easier to get this sorted out instead of more difficult? For that, I would uh, give an opportunity uh, if our partners from Oracle Cerner would like to comment as well about what it would take to synchronize the pharmacy and prescriber systems. Chairman, if I understood your question correctly, um, we had about 500 um, prioritized, or 500 things that needed to be changed in the system. My pharmacist sat down with the VA pharmacist to say, what is the top priority? They came up with about 10 to say, these are the first 10 we need to go after. It's not necessarily the fastest 10, these are the prioritized 10. And that is the ones we went after that turned into the seven projects that you've seen outlined where three already went live, we have more, one that went in the cube, more in block, in the next block, and the block after block 10. But that was because that is what VA prioritizes the most important to them to go after, not necessarily can you tell us which ones you can do the sure. fastest? Okay, so, so, so it's still, though, we're having these issues. Do you believe the Cerner, if, if you're going to uh, speak, Dr. Elsie, do you believe the Cerner pharmacy software is satisfactory right now? Is it satisfactory to meet all the goals of how the VA practices um, pharmacy right now? No, it is not. Mr. Seeley, you testified to the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee hearing in March that, quote, we can achieve quite a bit of this by reconfiguring the system without touching the code, and it can be done relatively quickly. I'm talking weeks, weeks not months, end quote. Does Oracle stand by the decisions you've made about when to rewrite the software code and when to just reconfigure the system? Yes, yes we do. The, the pharmacy examples of, of which we are not finished, and I think that is the driver for a lot of the dissatisfaction because of the seven major things that need to be fixed for pharmacy, three have not been delivered, and as I said in my opening statement, they are, they are focused on the provider side of a prescription, not the pharmacist side. The next four are focused on pharmacists. In terms of reconfiguring, uh, my, my testimony during that hearing was specific to the feedback that I heard in Columbus when I was with Dr. Evans and, the rest of the, and some of the rest of the team and heard direct feedback around the workflows in the system, not having anything to do with pharmacy, but just general workflows in the system, which the team described to me as being too restrictive, too locked down, and not giving enough, uh, if we will, autonomy at the edge to configure those systems. I stand by my statement that yes, should the VA choose to make those changes, they are configuration changes that we can make in weeks, not months, not years. Pharmacy so, piece, the pharmacy piece is a, re, a recoding of a, a recoding of function. Okay, I'm out of time here. I'm going to have to, to move on. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Representative Sherfless McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Dr. Evans. As I said in my opening, I'm concerned about the number of change requests that are still showing up more than two years after the first go live. I suspect that the VA's history of allowing the medical facilities to operate independently of each other has made this program complicated. What is the status of establishing a baseline EHR that all facilities would expect to adopt? There are many layers to that question. Um, I think first, one of the places where we do have opportunity is in the devices and capabilities that connect to the electronic health record. Again, in order to deliver um, a comprehensive solution that allows us to have the technology necessary to deliver the safe, high quality healthcare that we expect to deliver in the VA, we need more than just an electronic health record. We need bedside monitors in the ICU, we need intravenous pumps, we need um, uh, laboratory equipment, uh, uh, you know, radiologic systems, uh, what we call PAC systems for reading imaging. Um, and many of those buying decisions have been made at the local level traditionally because the interface of that system only had to be plugged into the local instance of our electronic health record, CPRS, or VISTA. Um, as we move forward with an enterprise healthcare system, every one of those additional systems bears a cost for us as we have to interface it with the federal electronic health record. 
that's not technology that's, that Oracle brings to the table. These are technologies that we're, we're buying to be able to run our gastroenterology suites, et cetera. Um, we are working to establish a baseline, and we're close, of what we, what we believe would be the capabilities that, for which we have existing interfaces, so that plugging them into the electronic health record is easier and faster as we move forward with deployments. The second part of the question is about a baseline around workflows. How do you run a primary care clinic? How do you do preoperative care? How do you take care of somebody after an operation? What, are the, what should the screens show? What are the questions we're gonna ask nurses or clinicians to answer? And that is work that our councils assist us with um, and that frankly the voice of the field is incredibly, of our end users is incredibly important because we do need to increasingly standardize what that looks like. But it needs to be a standard that's workable from an efficiency standpoint in the delivery of healthcare. Both of those areas are significant areas of focus as we engage in the reset. Presently, how have you evaluated workflow and practices across the enterprise to ensure that the baseline meets everyone, everyone's needs? One of the ways we do that is through the clinical councils. Um, we've just recently made changes to how um, we organize the clinical councils. The clinical councils are now a part of the Veterans Health Administration. Uh, we actually have a co-chair here. All of the councils are now co-chaired, including field representation, and they all include existing users of the new modernized EHR. And so in part, what we need to do is make sure that we have the voices of representing end users across the system in making those standardized um, decisions. We are still learning, but this is an area where I think we're seeing um, we're seeing positive mo movement in the right direction. Ms. Harris, do you have anything to add to this when it comes to the baseline EHR? Um, I think that that's, establishing a baseline is critical if you're intending to standardize across an enterprise, especially one as complicated as VA. Um, I think what I, I would like to note is um, that it's very important that the increased rate at which um, Cerner addresses these issues. I know, Mr. Chairman, you had mentioned the 79 business change re re requests. I mean, to date, I mean, that was two and a half years ago. The list is growing. Only six have been completed. That's a major issue. And so the rate at which these issues are addressed need to, I mean, Cerner needs to step up as well as, as, as VA in terms of their program management and, and contractor oversight as well. Um, so collectively, yes, the baseline is incredibly important. Getting those user satisfaction scores to increase as well um, is, is really critical to recovering from where we are today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Representative Self. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cecilia, before I go on, I think I've heard you say twice that it's not the pharmacist, it's the supply system. Is that layman's terms? It's the, the, the initial focus of the enhancements has been on the provider side. In other words, the person ordering the pharmacy. Not, we have not yet delivered enhancements that pharmacists at the VA will consume. That is the next block of delivery. Got it. Now I understand what you were saying. So um, there's, a, uh, there's a quote from, from one of your pharmacists, the increased risks due to delays, inefficiencies, vulnerabilities, manual workarounds, and the lack of responsiveness from Cerner to identified patient risks. Pharmacy staff must remain in a constant state of hypervigilance to recognize and intervene on those risks. Hypervigilance by the pharmacist. Um, can you comment on that? Because while this pharmacist used the word Cerner, Address those concerns for me. I would uh, appreciate Dr. Elsie's comments since he deals with the clinicians. So the hypervigilance in pharmacy. Um, pharmacists are, I have to find the PC way of saying it. They are very much attention to detail oriented when it comes to pharmacy um, filling medications. Um, they wanna make sure every I is dotted twice and every T is crossed twice. So when you talk about hypervigilance in a pharmacist, that is somewhat the norm. Um, they well, are, doctor, that's, that's not what this pharmacist is saying. 
uh, we're talking about staff burnout here under the new system. Sorry, sir, I don't understand your question to me, though. Uh, the question is, why do they think they have to be hypervigilant under the Cerner system as opposed to the VISTA system? Because back to Dr. Elzey's uh, point, uh, I too am a veteran, and what I'm hearing from the veterans is they're not getting good pharmacy uh, support under Cerner or VISTA. So that's my question to you. Why are, do they have to be hypervigilant under Cerner even more than VISTA if what I'm hearing is VISTA doesn't work that well either? So from my standpoint of where I sit, whenever you change systems, you're going to not be as comfortable as the system you've been working in for decades. It's going to take time to learn the new system. Okay. And two years is not enough time to get comfortable in the pharmacy sphere with the new system. Okay, do y'all have, do y'all have uh, numbers as to the VISTA errors versus the Cerner errors system-wide, pharmacy errors? Congressman Self, I do not have those errors in front of me, but if I may just uh, follow up a, a little bit if, on the question that was just Certainly. asked Go ahead. from a VA Please. pharmacy perspective. So VA pharmacists in general should not be operating in a state of hypervigilance. Uh, we should be operating within our well-established processes and procedures to safely deliver prescription fulfillment services. Um, I've been a VA pharmacist for over 26 years, mm -hmm. um, and I've used our um, electronic health record over a portion of that career, and um, I was felt very safe and comfortable and not in a state of hypervigilance. So uh, VA takes a lot of pride in pharmacy and what we do. Uh, we have a very dedicated staff to the mission of our agency, which is to care and serve our nation's veterans. And uh, that I just wanna say that I'm very grateful for. Uh, in regards to your question about the rates between VISTA and Cerner and the error rates, that's something I would have to take back for the record unless somebody else had those rates. In I, front of I would you. like to hear that. Uh, Ms. Harris, do you have any Thing to add? Well, the, the main thing that I want to add is, is going back to your original question, which I think is so important, is how do you recover? Um, in this particular situation with where we are today with the Cerner system um, or the new EHR system, implementing our 10 recommendations that we have open relative to increasing user satisfaction, I mean, it's, it's incredibly important that VA establish goals to assess user satisfaction, number one. That's, that is the most important thing that they need to do and demonstrate radical improvement before they move forward with future deployments. Uh, the, the second thing is to have VA really take ownership of the change management strategy because all these things that we are dealing with today, yes, there are system performance issues, but for the most part, it is so largely driven by that human component where users have to understand exactly what it is that they need to do in this new changed environment. And that's really difficult to do, but VA needs to take that leadership role in, in getting their users to, to be comfortable in this new environment. If the chairman will indulge me for one quick question, do you have a recommendation? Can they do this? I think that they can do this with very close scrutiny and oversight from this committee. And I think, and as well as um, through just really increased performance by both Oracle Cerner as well as through as well as with with VA as well. Um, honestly, I was very disappointed to hear that while VA has concurred with our recommendations, um, they they expect to complete the implementation of our recommendations by October 2023. That's five months away. To me, that that suggests that they're unserious about our recommendations and what it's gonna to take to implement it. But they, if, if they do effectively implement them, I think they're gonna be in a much better footing for success. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Ms. Harris, right while you had the microphone hot there, um, do you think that it is too much to expect someone that has a new system that is supposed to improve their output to be able to learn it, understand it, be able to, to deliver it in, in two and a half years? Sir, based on the current management 
of the system, I, I think that two and a half years is not enough time. I think that it's going to take a much longer runway for VA to change their culture. I mean, we have 130 different versions of VISTA. Um, the, the users at these different medical facilities are used to doing business in a certain way that's tailored to, to their, their facilities. And standardizing across the, the enterprises is, is going to be a very challenging thing. But again, it, it takes VA senior leadership to really ensure that, um, that, that the, the change management is done and done properly, where right. users feel um, that where users are in a better position to understand what they need to do in this new system. Dr. Silverman, turning to the April uh, release, it's my understanding it is supposed to synchronize power chart and the medication manager retail, MMR, by automatically deleting prescription records in one system and creating them in another, eliminating the time-consuming double entry process. Can you explain how this works and what it entails? Yes, uh, thank you, Congressman. The intended synchronization uh, from Enhancement 3B is for when the pharmacy at a VA medical center dispenses a prescription, uh, it is within common pharmacy practice that there may be some subtle changes of the prescription to dispense and honor the original intent. So simply put, if you have a prescription for 40 milligrams of a particular drug and the stock available is 20 milligram tablets, we update the directions accordingly, update the quantity accordingly, and dispense. And so the uh, intent of that enhancement is to make sure that that information goes from MMR back to power chart uh, automatically rather than asking the pharmacist to both make the dispensing uh, process and go to power chart to document that update. Very good. And is it true that you discovered a serious flaw in this enhancement involving prescription instructions and you're rolling back the software update? That is correct. And Dr. Silverman, was, uh, this was supposed to be the biggest, most important pharmacy improvement. According to the questionnaires, many of the pharmacists were already concerned that it would make what they see in the system even more cluttered and confusing. But it sounds like it blew up right on the launch pad. Uh, why did this happen, and what does it say about EHR's prospects to improve? Thank you for that. In terms of why it happened, I. Um, would like to assure that uh, the council was in close cooperation with Oracle Cerner on the initial testing, the evaluation in our non-production domains, and made uh, our contribution to the overall decision, yes, let's deploy this uh, with the CUBE release. What I believe happened, Congressman, is that what we haven't been doing as a VA and what we need to introduce is a longer testing process that would include what I'll call end-to-end -end testing from the prescriber to the pharmacist reviewing that prescription to simulated dispensing of that prescription through our automated equipment. And because we have not been testing to that thoroughness in an environment that uh, can adequately simulate our production, we did not recognize what would happen with those patient instructions. So as soon as that issue was reported, it was reported through Joint Patient Safety Reporting System, as Dr. Evans described, the council moved immediately towards a request and recommendation to disable the enhancement to give us the time to analyze Thank you. it. And, and, and we appreciate that so that we didn't risk any more safety to our veterans. Um, Mr. Cecilia, um, no offense, but do you, you think that it's fair to use the VA and our nation's heroes as a testing ground for your products? Um, I, I don't believe that we are. Well, these aren't coming off the shelf. Okay, these are, these, are, these are custom products. Do you think it's fair to use the VA and our nation's heroes as a testing ground for your products? We're, we're not universally creating custom products at our discretion. These are the, we, we are instructed and contracted to do so by the VA. As Dr. Silverman just, just pointed out, there's a testing process that happens and we're not rolling out something that hasn't been tested and authorized by the VHA. In the event that, that issues are discovered after the rollout, I, I do think Dr. Silverman's comments are correct. There has to be more end-to-end -end testing. If something is discovered, we quickly roll it back as we, as we do. Thank you. Representative Sheriff McCormick. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back to Ms. Harris, my question. GAO has an extensive body of work on VA struggles to implement large-scale IT projects, specifically on VA struggle with program management. Can you elaborate on what GAO has observed and what recommendations you have for the VA to be successful? Sure, so what we've observed is, I think um, it, it's, it stems back to poor, project, poor IT project management in general. Um, in not having defined user requirements adequately up front and also not really understanding the, um, have, or not having reliable cost and schedule estimates for, for the, their IT initiatives. Um, so those in general have been many of the issues that we've identified with um, IT programs such as EHRM. Um, now, in this particular case, we've made 15 total recommendations related to the EHRM program. 10 of them are priority, and that comes from our most recent work. And again, it goes back to increasing that user dissatisfaction and ensuring that the satisfaction scores go up, that that is critical to the success of EHR, as well as improving their change management, ensuring that, that their users are adequately trained in how to use a system, but also understanding the business process related to the changes and the transformation that, that's happening enterprise-wide relative to EHR. In your testimony, you stated that contractor change management activities focus on activities required to deploy the system, but did not address user challenges with transitioning to new workflow processes. If, is there any reason why VA should continue to focus on and fund training for Oracle Cerner system until they have focused and standardized workflow processes? Yeah, I think that the priority should, should or the significant amount of their effort needs to be paid towards in tra training the users on, on the new business processes, the new workflows, understanding what they need to do in the new system, as well as understanding as a whole um, what they're expected to do. I, I think that at these facilities, I think that they are team players. They want to, they, I think they want to, and, th and they are on board with changing. It's just that um, the, the systems, the, the EHR system has a significant amount of issues. And again, Cerner also needs to step up in addition to VA in terms of addressing those, those performance issues. Um, I, again, I'll go back to the 79 business change requests. Only six have been addressed in two and a half years. That pace is unacceptable. The EHR Reset Act would require that change management activities be led by VA rather than the contractors. Is this consistent with your recommendation, and would this benefit VA long-term to take great control, greater control over the change management activity? Absolutely. Um, having an independent validation and verification of the system post-deployment is critical. Um, it's something that we have made a recommendation on um, so that VA can have a third party go in, take a look, and systematically catalog what those issues are and then systematically address um, the Th those issues. Um, that is something that is called for by best practice. It's also something that DOD did when they rolled out MHS Genesis. After their first deployment, they paused the program, did the IVMV, and they did not deploy to future sites until they addressed everything related to those issues in that report. Your testimony addresses issues with user satisfaction and VA's lack of established targets. Can you expand on your testimony and let the committee know why not establishing user satisfaction goals is detrimental to the future use of the program. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's hard to tell how much progress has been made if you don't have a baseline established for, for where you are and where you need to be relative to um, user satisfaction. You have to have those metrics in place so that you are measuring and being very objective about the progress made and being in a position to show that you have demonstrated adequate improvements before you move forward with future deployments. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Surplus McCormick. Okay, uh, Dr. Evans, uh, we've been hearing about many of the unresolved issues described in the questionnaires for over a year. And I'm not talking about technicalities, I'm talking about things with serious health and safety consequences, like dispensing duplicate medication, refills that failed to be created, and prescriptions that never reached the pharmacy request file. How are you going to implement these fixes without creating more complications? 
Well, um, first, I think as you've heard Ms. Harris testify, one of the, we need to balance an increased velocity of delivering these fixes as well as increased rigor on the testing and understanding of and prioritization of how we deliver those fixes. Um, that's something that's gonna require um, really tight collaboration between the council, our end users who are using the system and know what it feels like and is every day, Oracle and the program uh, as we execute uh, this at the, at the larger level. So in part, it's about getting aligned and prioritizing what the most important issues are and then executing those with sufficient velocity. I agree that we're, I don't think we've been executing with the velocity that we need to in order to get where we need to get to have this system functioning in a way that meets VA's needs where the pharmacy the pharmacists and the providers are functioning as a single team, reading from the same sheet of music, caring for the same veterans. Thank you. Mr. Celia, making these enhancements to Oracle Pharmacy software and the EHR in general, uh, I apologize, but it seems similar to constantly patching a leaking roof to me, okay, to the general public. Is the only true solution to scrap the pharmacy modules and buy or build new software? I, I'm sorry, I missed the end. And buy and build new software? Is the only true solution to scrap the pharmacy modules and buy or build new software? I, I don't believe so. I mean, I, I believe we've been, as I said in the beginning, you know, the, the, the VA process for pharmacy, as we know, is, is different than uh, the rest of the world. And we have uh, been working together to build the enhancements. As I said, there are seven main things. Three of them are done. The next four to go. So I, I think it's I think it's early in the pharmacy process to judge as to whether or not um, the end product is, uh, is 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 not so good. I'm not surprised to hear that right now people don't like it because it's not complete. It's not finished. The the, the problem is, though, Mr. Cecilia, is that the taxpayers continue to pay for this experiment. And the veterans continue to pay for this experiment. And, and so at what point is Oracle going to either take possession of this obligation, this responsibility that they, that, that they entered into, that they, that they took, and stop laying the responsibility off on everyone else? I don't believe we are laying the responsibility on everybody else. Ten and a half months ago when we took this responsibility, the, time, the estimated time frame to complete the pharmacy enhancements was three years. We delivered the first three and four months. We will deliver the rest of them this year. All right. Dr. Evans, uh, Mr. Celia, is this a situation where we can have it good or fast, but not both? I think that's a general, I mean, in, in, <laughs> that's a maxim in general, right? I mean, but, but I do, I, I guess I would say, I think we are, you know, we're working together to identify what good is. We've had a discussion about that during this hearing. Um, one of the reasons that together, you know, the, the VA, um, announced a reset is to say, we need to be able to turn our attention towards these improvements. That is, turn all of our attention towards the improvements that are necessary. So we're not balancing both the significant effort of preparing for deployments at new facilities and actually executing those deployments with the improvements of the system. And so I do believe that there's an opportunity for us by focusing just on the system improvements, for us to get more people, more talent directed at making the improvements that are necessary faster while preserving quality. So I do think there's a path to both good and faster. 
Thank you. I, I appreciate that. But from my standpoint, what I see is some things getting fixed at the top of the list, creating more problems that then get added to the bottom of the list. And the list continues to get larger. With that, I will yield to Representative Sherfless McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Evans, earlier when we were talking about baseline EHR, you seemed to indicate that VA was still developing it. How do you expect to move forward with the program if the baseline hasn't been establishing? It feels like we're building a plane without, we're flying with, and while we're building the plane at the same time. Um, it's interesting you say that. That's actually um, in the press release when we announced um, the reset is exactly what I said, that we're building the plane while we're flying it. And that's one of the reasons we um, have elected to say, let's focus on some of these significant program improvements that are necessary to prepare us for the longer term success of the program. That is, let's stop flying the plane while also building it. Let's build the plane as it needs to be. And a piece of that is increased clarity around the system baseline to support the delivery of an enterprise system, which is a big change for VA, um, an important change and a big change. Um, and so that's partly what we're doing during the reset is doing that important work. Dr. Evans, in your testimony, you mentioned that go live preparations are ongoing at the Lowell, the Lovewell Federal Healthcare Center. My question is, will the system deployed at Lovewell be more aligned with DOD's version of Millennium or VA's? Yes, the James A. Lovell Federal Healthcare Center, as you're aware, is a unique facility. It is a fully integrated joint VA and DOD healthcare facility. Um, the uh, staff there come from both the DOD and the VA, and they operate as a single staff, caring for both veterans, service members, and beneficiaries of the DOD. Their needs are unique. Um, we, the deployment, the only path forward to a deployment there is a synchronous deployment where we come together with the DOD and the Federal Electronic Health Record Modernization Office in support of the James A. Level Federal Healthcare System to deliver the capabilities that they need. Um, we will be looking at what the DOD's workflows are and what the VA's workflows are and are reconciling that to allow us to deliver a single experience to support care delivery at that site. I don't think I can predict exactly what percentage of DOD specific workflows will be chosen versus VA or what that hybrid will look like. But what I can say is that we are fully committed to that being an aligned path forward. Um, again, coordinated by the Federal Electronic Health Record Modernization Office um, with DOD and VA driving the success there at that facility. If the system is not prepared to be rolled out in any other VA facilities, why are you planning to deploy there? By the time we get to the James A. Level Federal Healthcare Center, the system will have been deployed across the entire Department of Defense healthcare system with the exception of the James A. Level Federal Healthcare System, again, a joint facility. Um, so when we arrive there, the only DOD employees who will not be using the system, when we arrive there for the go live, the only DOD employees will be those who are employees of the James A. Level Federal Healthcare System. So I think first, um, we, um, it will be a system that is being used across that entire enterprise. Second, I anticipate we will benefit from this program reset. The, the scheduled go live is not until 2024. Um, we have numerous months ahead of us that the improvements that we've been talking about here as part of the reset will be able to be delivered in anticipation of that go live. So we'll be adding value um, to what has been a successful program in the DOD. Ms. Harris, I have a quick question. Do you have any recommendations for the VA before undergoing this go live? Yeah, I think that um, taking very seriously the recommendations that we've made is, is going to be critical. 
understanding the user's needs and, and what Dr. Evans had, has just laid out, I think is gonna be very critical for, for, for VA and, and this integration with DOD ensuring that, that they are tightly committed, which it, it sounds, according to Dr. Evans, is, is going well so far. So I think that that's gonna be really important. But again, um, ensuring that the users understand what it is that they need to do in the new system, adequately training them, not just in the system itself, but on the new workflows is essential. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Sherfless McCormick. And I am glad to uh, recognize Representative Kerry. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I sent a letter last November um, after two veterans who were patients at the Columbus VA died. One of the veter veterans never reserved, was never received his antibiotic, and the other was not contacted to reschedule after he had missed an appointment. So Dr. Evans and Dr. Silverman, the VA responded to our letter in February and provided some information. It turns out that the antibiotic was never actually mailed. The tracking number in the system was misleading. The family never knew why they were supposed to pick up, the, or that they were supposed to pick up the medication. Can you explain how this happened and how is that being corrected? Uh, Dr. Silverman. Either one of you. Yep. Thank you. Um, I am aware of the incident that you described, and while I can't uh, discuss the specifics of the patient case, the root of the information was that a report in the system that identified that tracking number was providing erroneous information. Uh, this case uh, identified that, and the report that provided that misinformation has since been corrected. So it's not gonna happen again? That will not happen again. So, so let me ask you, in the other veteran case, uh, one of the VA staff was supposed to call and reschedule his appointment. Uh, the system was supposed to remind them to do that. Why was there no automated reminder but absent of that, how do the veterans fall through the cracks in situations like that? Either one of you. Dr. Evans, if you, if you do have information, I'm not familiar with that particular case. Yeah, I'm not either. I can say that um, um, appointment reminders um, are an important capability of the electronic health record. Um, uh, they're really a, an ancillary capability. Um, they're done differently, um, the sort of the technical solution for appointment reminders um, with the Oracle record um, has been different than how we do appointment reminders in Vista. Um, although we are working to align that back to a single common approach to appointment reminders. But I, I'd have to take for the record to, to, um, to look into more of the details of the specific I, mean, I missed a, I mean, I missed a, I missed a, a doctor's appointment not one I really wanted to do anyway, but I missed a doctor's appointment uh, and I got like five reminders that I missed it. Not to mention the five reminders from my wife to tell me that I missed the appointment. But I mean, it was, it was very simple. I got emails, I got texts. It just seemed very odd that, uh, that there was no follow-up on that. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. And I'm going to yield to Representative Sherfless McCormick for some closing statements now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you everyone for your testimony today. I thought we had a productive discussion this afternoon. We spent a lot of time talking about pharmacy issues today, but it is clear to me that these issues are a symptom of something much bigger. VA has a long history of failure when it comes to IT modernization efforts, and most of those failures are because VA lacks strong program management. VA, with, with VA's delayed Delay of Future Go Lives and EHR Reset Act, I'm confident that we can move the needle forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Representative Sherfless McCormick. I want to thank all our witnesses for appearing today to discuss pharmacy and the future of the electronic health record modernization effort. You're responsible for the well-being of millions of veterans. As I said in the last hearing, this cannot be a conversation just about IT systems. It has to be a conversation about whether the VA healthcare is meeting our veterans' needs and what policies and systems support them. The only honest conclusion is the Oracle Cerner Pharmacy software is failing to do that. And that failure stretches far beyond the pharmacy. The worst thing the VA could do is continue down this dead-end road 
perpetuating the same failed strategy and paying out billions of dollars. That would be incredibly irresponsible. The contract renegotiation deadline is coming up next week, and I expect to see VA disentangle itself from this monopoly. If there is a continued role for Oracle, it is in using its own resources to improve its products to make the existing Oracle Sonar sites whole. Today's hearing gives us every indication that many of those products simply are not capable of improving in the time frame that we need. The VA should cut their losses and move on. Otherwise, you are doing nothing more than continuing to march down the same dead-end road and betraying the veterans and the taxpayers that you were supposed to serve. I want you to think about that very carefully. Thank you all again for your participation in